well, I'm doing something this morning that I said I'd never do, or in my mind I thought I'd never do. I don't think I ever said it, but I'm actually going to use my phone in part of the sermon, so don't cast me out yet. Wait, wait till you, wait till you hear what I, I play, and then, then you can decide. So, all right. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you want to be finding the book that you've already uh, had plenty of lesson in this morning, uh, if I was smart, I would just say amen and we'd go home because uh, y'all have already been all over it. Sister Frankie was all over it in Sunday school, but be finding 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. And I'm going to use some scripture this morning that God has had us use several times in the past few months, but we're going to go at it a little differently today. And then at the end, I want to show you why you've heard all your life that you must stand for God, and that, that you, and, and as you all heard in Sunday school this morning, you're going to have to stand for your belief, and you're going to have to stand for your faith. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you with real live events that is, that is taking place in our nation today and then take you to Scripture and show you what's happening because the Bible tells me, as I studied it, as, as, as I began to feel the call from God to preach His Word and then when He began to, to move me into the position of pastor, I really had no guide for that. I had no, I had no role model to show me what, how you effectively do that. So I went to Scripture, and the Scripture tells me I am to watch out for you. I am your watchman. I am to see what the world is doing and to reinforce you to not only stand on Scripture, but for you to live the most blessed and peaceful and joyful life that you can. And the only way you can do that is through the Word of God, amen, and living for God. So I've done some things this week that I said I wouldn't do, but I did it because I felt as your watchman it is my duty to see what's going on in the world, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But as you're finding 1 John chapter 2, I want to define a word for you. And the word is advertisement. It is a notice or announcement in a public medium promoting a product, service, or event. Now, would you agree with me that in this country there's those that are going hungry? There's, now, I'm not talking about the people who choose to be in financial I'm, that's not what I'm talking about, because the Bible is clear. If you, if you can work, you need to work. That's biblical. But would you say we send a lot of foreign aid, we do a lot of things to help other countries when we ourselves are hurting, amen? Yeah. Well, maybe we're not hurting as bad as we think we are. Listen to how much money was spent last year in the United States alone on advertisement. $297.5 billion. There's no shortage of money, folks. We're just putting it in the wrong place, amen? $297 billion spent on advertising to sell their products. Now, I want to turn it spiritual for just a minute. Huh. I love it when God lines stuff up. And folks, this morning, he lined it up. The Sunday school lesson was talking about examining yourself. Let me read to you what he put in my heart. If you were the only advertisement for Jesus that the people around you saw, would they buy Jesus? Would they want Jesus? You may go to church every Sunday. You may have a bumper sticker that says, I love Jesus. You may post verses on Facebook. But what do people really see and hear and feel from you? I felt, I felt something this morning I'd never really thought about before. But, you know, I've told you before, I've had a lot of people approach me 
in the past when I was working and they'd found jailhouse religion because what did they want? They wanted bonded out. But I thought this morning, Sister Frankie said she's been here 46 years. And I know the core group that was here when we first came, you know how I know Sister Frankie knows that group's faith? Because she's seen them for 46 years. She knows how they're going to react. She probably even knows some of your flaws. Amen? Uh, she's probably seen the good and the bad. But time, folks, time reveals our faith. Amen? Because anybody can say anything they want to. They can say, oh, how I love Jesus. But then the trouble comes and what happens? They'll turn and run. They didn't really mean it. But if people around you, whether it be at work or at school or, as y'all said this morning, Walmart, if you're, the, if you're in there and you're a Christian, guess what you're doing? Whether you want to admit it or not, you are an advertisement for God. People drive by here, do you think... Hector, in the area around, and, and Dover, don't want to leave Michael Joe out. Pretty small area, right? We pretty much know everybody, or we used to. We know the older generation. Do you think if I come through and I said, hey, if I went over to Dover, I said, you know Oral Humphreys? You know how many of them would know he goes to Hagelsville Church? The majority would know. They, if you go to Hector and ask about Ken and Diane Stanton, the majority of them is going to know they go to Cagelsville Community Church. So then if they know this about us, they're not here with us, are they? So what do they know about us? What they see out there. So if what they see out there is the only Bible they read is you, if the only Jesus they know about is the one that you're living would they, want, would they want to live for Jesus? Do they see it in you? Do they see the joy in you? Do they see the peace in you? Do they see something different in you than what they see in the world? Self-examination. Well, if we do live for him, again, this is scripture that God's had us, I don't know how many times in the past few months, but we've been here before. We've used pieces of this, but today I'm going to extend it a little bit. If you would, turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. When you find that, if you would, stand this morning to honor the reading of God's Word. 1 John chapter 2. If you're there with me this morning, I'm going to start in verse 3. Again, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this day. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful Sunday school lesson you sent to us this morning and the messenger you sent it to us through, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for her healing, Lord, and we're so glad to have her back with us. And God, we thank you this morning for the children st standing and working in your house, Lord, and we thank you for the beautiful songs. And Lord, now it comes to the preaching of your word. And God, from the bottom of my heart, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, God. Please cleanse this vessel. Prepare me, God, to surrender to you. I pray that the words that come from this vessel this morning, Lord, be directly from you. And God, I pray that you prepare us. Open up the ears of our heart. Open up the ears of our mind, Lord, to hear your word this morning. Sink it deep in us, God. Help us self-examine. Help us turn to you, God. Help us repent today, for your kingdom is at hand. And God, I just pray that when we leave here today, that we will be more like you called us to be and we'll be effective tools for you to reach the lost and dying in this world. And in Jesus' precious name, his church prayed. Amen. Folks, it's not hard to understand 1 John. The author of 1 John is very, very clear. He, John makes it clear. That's not hard to understand what I just read to you. 
If we say we know God, but we don't obey him, we're a liar. And the truth is not in him. May I remind you who the truth is. The truth is Jesus Christ. If we, if we abide in God, we also ought to walk even as Jesus walked. He left us a pattern. Me and Michael Joe was talking right before church started. And, uh, it, I mean, everything that's happened this morning has just reinforced this. And we was talking about how your faith, how your life should back up your words. And I told him, I said, the one thing God told me one time is, is my hips need to represent my faith more than my lips. People need to see it in me more than they hear it in me. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't hear it in us, but folks, have you ever heard it from somebody and you knew immediately from their walk that they were, they were lying? Amen. We've all seen that. You can feel it. Uh, there's so many false prophets and false teachers right now. Uh, you can feel it. You just feel it. That's discernment. But if we advertise for God and we live for him, these things will be evident in our lives. We will obey him and we will love. That's the two things. We will obey God's word. And I heard Sister Frankie say it this morning. Love all our neighbors, amen? Not just the ones that are nice to us. And let me ask you something. And folks, this, I'm preaching to me this morning, and if it helps you, more power to you. But I don't ever want you to think I am condescending, folks. I need God's word. I'm just sharing it with you. I need it in my life. I need God in my life, and I know you do too. But I wonder how, we say we love everybody. Anybody here besides me drive by houses of people that don't go to church anywhere and have yet to stop and invite them? I've got to do better, and so do you. Because if we love them, what would we try to do? We'd try to introduce them to Jesus, wouldn't we? Because that's, that's the only way. But you see, our walk must match our talk. If it doesn't, it's false advertising. Anybody ever bought something because it looked good on TV and then got it home and it didn't do nothing like it's supposed to? I was thinking about this. I was trying to think of a good example, and this is the best example I can ever come up with because I happened to eat there yesterday, and that's a McDonald's commercial. Any of you ever got a burger there that looked like it did on the commercial? Nowhere close. That thing on that commercial big and juicy, and then you get that one there, and it's all bun, and it looks like they cooked it two days ago. False advertising. Do you know what it is? If we come to church on Sunday and proclaim Jesus Christ, but we go out there and we live like hell through the week, it's false advertising. I've had people curl their lips at me for saying this, but folks, I'll stand on it till the day I, I leave to go home with God. It is more dangerous for a, for a family to bring their children to church and live like hell through the week than it is just to stay home and stay away from church. Because if you stay home and stay away from church, you're at least, at least giving your, sh your children a shot at someday running into a true Christian and hearing about Jesus Christ and knowing that there's something different about it. If you take them to church every Sunday and they hear the word of God and then they come home and folks, you realize how much we look to mom and dad for our lives, how much it affects our lives, amen? I guarantee you, the older we get, the more mom and dad we see in us, Amen. So then when you get there and, you, and you're taking them, so it's important enough to you to go on Sunday. So you're letting them know there's some importance to it. But then Monday through Saturday, he's never mentioned. You, you, live like, you live in sin. You don't even talk about him. What are you teaching them? That God is only available Sunday 10 to 12. And that's all that matters. Folks, God should be every minute, every second of our life. Amen. We need him that much. Now, Mark chapter 7, verse 6. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Esaias, which is Isaiah, prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That is a quote from Isaiah 29, 13. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Me and Brother Michael Joe was talking about some 
videos he'd saw that was very disturbing. I knew immediately when he said the man's name. I said, you can see when they pause the video, you can see Satan in the man's face. And yes, he's a pastor. But I can tell you right now, he don't know my God. He does not know Jesus Christ. And he says, he spews all kind of false doctrine and he has this evil little giggle. In the video, the person that runs the video will stop the giggle and mid-giggle. And folks, you can just see evil. And the discernment, I get goosebumps. It makes me sick. I, I, I cannot stand it. And I, I won't even grace the pulpit with his name. Uh, but that is what... I'm praying God instills in us today a discernment to know what's real. And if you've ever, I had to take a counterfeit class when I was still working, and you know how they train you to spot counterfeit money? Study real money. The better you know the original, the easier you'll see a fake. May I tell you, Scripture's the same way. The better you know the original, the quicker you will see a fake. And folks, I know, I know, I will not be your pastor forever. So when I leave here, I want you to know the truth. Don't ever take my word for it. Don't ever take any man's word for it. Open the word of God and make sure what they're telling you is true. Amen? That is the only way. But you see, I want to tell you this. Honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. False advertisement hurts others. You hear me this morning. If you're false advertising for Christ, you're hurting others, but you listen to me. You are destroying yourself. Folks, you know why... God don't let us judge. Plain and simple, we're not fair. You want me to tell you why we're not fair? Because we judge the ones we love less harshly than the ones we don't love. And I don't care who you are, you do. If it's somebody else's kid, somebody needs to get a hold of that heathen. If it's my kid, he's just really hyper. He's just, he's excited. You judge them different because you love them and ones you don't. But now listen to me. Whose sin is it easier for me to see, yours or mine? Yours. Why? Because I look at you harsher sometimes than I look at myself. Now, since I've become a pastor, I, I, I can no longer say that because I'm probably harder on myself than I am any other human. You can ask my girls when they were little and they'd play softball or, or basketball, and Cassie can amen this. They knew going in that if another girl messed up, I was going to yell at because I didn't want to yell at other people's kids. So they got that. And you can ask them in church. When they were little, we'd let them sit in the floor and color. When their friends would come sit by them, when their friends would start talking, we'd say, Cassie, Molly, shut up. And they wasn't saying nothing. But guess what? It worked. They understood it. We understood it. And the kids talking understood it. They're probably thinking, well, your parents are horrible. <laughs> huh. But folks, let's just be honest. Why we don't judge ourselves as harshly is because what? We know our intent, right? How do you know the intent of anybody else? You don't. I heard somebody in here a couple weeks ago share a story about pulling out in front of somebody. Or that somebody pulled out in front of them and they didn't, you know, automatically we get mad, right? Or your pastor does. Especially if there's nobody behind me and they pull right out in front of me and then just start creeping. But I don't know where they're going. We've got to be really careful. Really careful. We don't know what kind of day they've had. We don't know what they're going through. We don't know how bad they're hurting. And folks, you may run into somebody and say, I, I'm, I don't see real well anymore. So if I see you in a store and I don't just, hey, how you doing? I don't see you, okay? I, I have not recognized you from that distance anymore. 
But some people may do that and think, well, that's snub. He's a pastor. He ought to be nicer than that. No, I'm blind. Just be patient with me. If I get up close, I'll talk to you all day long, but let me know who you are. We never know the intent, but that's why, that's why God don't let us judge, because we're not fair. We're tilted. God's fair, because God knows the intent of our heart. He knows what we're thinking, and he knows where we're going. He knows what we're doing. So, folks, let God handle the judgment. Let's handle the loving. Amen? Now, I'm not saying we cannot uh, be a fruit inspector. The Bible says we're to be a fruit inspector. If I see something in young Greg's life that he starts producing some fruit, you know, that I, that I see, and vice versa, if he sees me start producing some fruit, that he says, you know what, the pastor shouldn't be doing that. God tells him to come to talk to me in a loving way, not to tear me up, but to say, hey, brother, you know what, I love you, and you know what, you mean so much to me, but, but I see this in your life, and I really don't think this is what God wants for you. Folks, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Amen? Uh, and I heard, heard Pastor Adrian Rogers, he, he, he talks about this subject better than anybody I've ever heard in my life, and he's very much against alcohol. And, and he believes, he believes, please, please hear me, he believes that the Bible teaches that you're not to, to mess with alcohol at all. I won't go that far because Paul told Timothy that he should drink a glass of wine for his stomach, for his sickness. I'm not going to argue that. I don't care. But here's what I can tell you. I don't drink alcohol because I've seen what it does to people. I've seen the lives it destroys. Now, the Bible says, and Paul says, to me all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. Now, obviously, something that's clear, black and white sin, you cannot do, right? But there's some gray areas where some people are uncomfortable and some people are not. Uh, so, let's just use that. If I went out to a restaurant, and this is why I will not. If I went out to a restaurant and I decided I want to have a glass of wine with my meal or any kind of alcoholic beverage with my meal and some of y'all come in there and you had kids with you and they see me drinking. Now think about this. Then they, it comes to the age when they want to drink, they want to try it or something. You tell them, no, you shouldn't drink. And they go, no, wait a minute. Pastor Tony drinks, and he's a pretty good old guy. You see what I've done? I've caused somebody else to stumble. If we will live our life that way, folks, and the Bible tells us that. If my actions causes my brother to stumble, I am not to do it. It becomes a sin to me, while something that it would be permissible, but if me doing that causes you or anybody else to stumble, then it becomes a sin. So don't do it. It's pretty clear. And the Bible says, and to me, this clears up the whole issue. It says, avoid all appearance of evil. That pretty much sums it up, don't it? If you think there's anything evil about it, avoid it. So, false advertisement. I'm fixing to get into the real world events and show you what's going on, but I want to finish laying the foundation. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient. And unto every good work, reprobate. And I do, I do want to apologize. I do know there's some people listening that listen every week. And God is kind of, he's, I think he's, he's definitely not softening my stance on the word. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes false teachers and false preachers bring up an anger in me, and you've seen it. I want them to know I'm not angry with them. I'm angry with what they're doing. I'm angry with Satan that he's twisted the word. I love these people, and I am actively praying that God would open their eyes to see that what they're doing is leading people down the wrong path. 
just forgive me for letting the anger boil over sometimes. I am human and I'm sorry, and I ask for forgiveness. I want to do it in a way that effectively reaches the heart of the listener. But Titus says, they that profess that they know God, but in, in the life they live, they deny it. Folks, that is where we're at. If you watch any kind of news, interviews, you'll see these people on there. Oh, yeah, I, I love God. <laughs> Let me tell you where this has led us to and the danger. And I'm not picking on, please don't, I'm not picking on this person. They may be a really good singer, uh, and they may be a really good entertainer, but their view of Christ is so messed up. And give me a minute, I'll remember her name. She's the one everybody's afraid is going to take over the Super Bowl. Uh, Taylor Swift, thank you. She's an entertainer, folks. That's the end of it, Okay. But we have a generation of people who think what she says carries more weight than what anybody else says. And let me quote her. I'm from Tennessee, and the Christian they're talking about ain't our Christian, ain't our Christ. She's exactly right. She has no idea who Jesus Christ is. And I pray for her. I, d I have nothing against her. I, because look at the influence that she could have if she would simply give her heart and soul to Jesus Christ. She stands for everything that Christ is against. But I heard yesterday out of the mouth of a pastor. Folks, y'all going to have to pray for me because I'm either going to have to up my blood pressure medicine or just totally quit listening to this stuff. Out of the mouth of a pastor, he says, I believe God is evolving. Oh, that God is becoming more tolerable and accepting. Folks, that is not our God. Hebrews 13, chapter, eight, chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word does not change. Amen? Jesus doesn't change. But Lord of mercy, now, let me share with you what's going on. And I struggled with this, and I wanted to make sure that I was standing for what God wanted me to stand for. We have a battle going on, folks, in our nation, and it is full-fledged right in our face. And there's people who are saying that pastors have no business getting into politics. May I tell you what happens if you remove pastors and godly people from politics? Pick up the, church, pick up the book and read a letter to the American church. I'm over halfway finished with it now. And that is exactly how Adolf Hitler came to reign in Germany, because the church stepped back and let the government have its way. I want to play something for you. And if you hear something wrong with this, please let me know. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not, well, not much, but uh, if, if you hear something in this prayer, and then I'll explain everything to you, you just raise your hand if you think this man says anything against Jesus Christ. In order, the prayer will be offered by the guest chaplain, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, Chino, California. Let's pray. Almighty God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, together we come before you in humility as a people in need of your forgiveness, your mercy, your goodness, and your grace. For these 250 so years, our fathers in this Congress have prayed for your guidance and protection. And so we stand here 
in humble petition that you today might do the same. That this nation and its unparalleled constitution, your great gift to all freedom-loving people, might be renewed here and across this land as a beacon of hope to all who seek peace. I ask you today, Father, to bring to us a great awakening of righteousness and confidence in you, who alone is mighty to save. Hear my cry in this hour of great need that we might be humbly blessed before you in the repentance of our national sins. You, almighty God, are the source of all wisdom, and there is no wisdom but that which comes from you. So please come upon those here who are the stewards over the business of our nation with your wisdom, which comes from above, and with your holy fear, knowing that your coming day of judgment draws near when all who have been and are now in the authority will answer to you, the great judge of heaven and of earth for the decisions that they make here in this place. I offer this prayer to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Son, your Son, and our crucified Savior and resurrected Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Anything. Nothing but godly words. Folks, that prayer was uttered this January in front of Congress. And as soon as he finished, the Democratic Party stood and said, that is hate speech. And they said, because he said, Father, that God is not a man. And they said, because Jesus Christ, folks, they, they labeled him. Because he believes like me and you. They labeled him a Christian nationalist. They want him banned and fined. We are at war, church. I did not seek this, but God will not let it go away. So God called. I did not want to watch the other night. I was not going to watch. But as your watchman, God said, watch. Let me tell you what was said. And folks, it makes me shake. I heard from the President of the United States, out of his mouth, he rebuked the Supreme Court who was sitting in front of him for revoking Roe versus Wade. And then he said, Congress, if you will get me the bill, I will make it law. And then he said, transgenders, I've got your back. Folks, if I'm not political, but let me tell you something. The Democratic Party in the United States of America is controlled by their father, the devil. If it's got a D, it is the devil. And it is our job to stand against them and restore heaven to this earth. You understand me? We're to stand for God. And folks, get, don't get me wrong. The other party stinks too. We've got nobody standing for us. But now we have no option. When they say that marriage is no longer between a man and a woman, when they will stand, when, when you will stand on national TV in front of God and everybody and say, I will make abortion legal, bring it to me. Transgenders, I've got your back. And then the Congress will turn on a man for praying. Folks, they're after us. And if we don't do something, they will have us. Amen? Amen. We'll be in jail. Now, I don't like politics. But when they call God out, we have no option. We are like David on that battlefield. They are the Goliath. But we're to go to them and say, who are you to deny my God? And folks, we will win. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 9, verse 26. And I, I just want to, I want to pray for Pastor Jack Hibbs, and I want to pat him on the back, because I'm going to tell you, a lot of pastors in America today... You see, I didn't know this till afterward. They gave him a list of things he could not say in the prayer. And he said in the first line, I violated three of them. God bless him. Said he could not use the name Jesus Christ. Could not refer to God as the Father. He said, I will not be ashamed of my Father. I will not be ashamed to stand. Praise God for men like Jack Hibbs. 
Because Luke 9, 26, and folks, this is why I'm telling you this morning. Because every one of us is fixing to be in that arena. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and in the ho of the holy angels. Folks, if you're given that opportunity, and I know you're not going to be in front of Congress. You may just be in front of a group of people. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. At first, when I first started, it's pretty intimidating. But you know what I learned as I, as I grew? And, and if I'll just simply get up here and tell you what God puts in my heart, I don't have to be intimidated. If you don't like it, that's between you and God. As long as it's out of this book, amen? As long as I can stand firm, that's, bet that's between you and God. But there will come a time when you won't be standing for Jesus Christ is, is not going to be the popular answer. You may be the only one in that group. Do not back down. Do not be ashamed. Because if you're ashamed, it says he will be ashamed of us. We must stand for God regardless of the situation or the circumstances. And I want to leave you with this verse. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Because at the end of the day, this is the question we must all answer of who we're aiming to please. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. For, na for do now I persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, listen to this, I should not be the servant of Christ. If John Hibbs would have stood in front of Congress and followed their rules, he would not be a servant of Christ. You say, Pastor, that's harsh. Take it up with God. I just read you the verse. If we're ashamed of him, he's ashamed of us. And if we do not stand for him, we are not his children. Amen? If you would, stand with me all over this building. I just ask today that you'd bow your heads. And I just want to ask you one question this morning. Because tonight when I lay down my head, I want to have the peace at knowing that I gave you the opportunity God wanted you to have. You've heard the word today. God is calling you. If you're under the sound of my voice this morning and you've not given your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, he's calling you. You're not here by accident. He's calling you. I wish I could tell you how much longer you have. I don't know, and neither do you. I pray that we all get home safely today, but sometimes that's just not the case. Sometimes we're called home early. Early to us, but right on time to him. Are you ready? If you're not ready to go, friend, please do not leave this building without getting ready. This altar's open, and I encourage you to come to this altar and give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. I want you to lay down that pride. I want you to lay down what the devil says. You've got all this time, and friend, I promise you, time is fleeting. 